grey coveralls, their lower faces obscured by masks, Kusak, Chilar, Mayuku and Malash kept to the deep shadows at the sides of the buildings as they made their way carefully to the warehouse district where the brothel they planned to hit that night was situated. They'd chosen that night because no one would be expecting another raid from the Zari so close to the last one. Their target this time was one designed to hit the ordinary worker. Causing damage to the main brothel would hit them hard because they had to work hard to earn the right to visit the drones that were employed there. It was sure to cause an outcry among the workers. Their target building was one of the smaller warehouses that had been made over to be part club and part cheap hotel, where the males who earned enough credits would be granted a few hours with one of the drones. Though sterile, the drones were not genderless, and customers could choose male or female as their preference demanded and availability allowed. At this time in the morning, well after 1am, the fa facility was closed for the night. Their plan was to get into the building and plant some explosives around the doorway, and by the back exit scrawl the zaddy sword on a main wall, drop some leaflets and leave, setting off the charges as they went. They intended to cause enough damage to render the place unusable, but not enough to risk the lives of those inside. Street lamps were few and far between in this area of the city. Lights were reserved for the large compounds, where transport vehicles unloaded their cargo. Their vehicles parked half a mile away in one of the last residential areas. Their route took them through streets lined with smaller warehouses on the edges of the large industrial parks. As one of them ran forward to scout the area ahead, the others hung back in the deepest shadows, in back alleys, behind dumpsters, wherever cover they could find. At a signal from a forward man, the others would join him, one at a time. They were close now, only a chain link fence between them and the building. Chilar took the cutters out of his backpack and clipped a gap through which they could crawl into the compound. Once inside, they dashed again for the deep shadows at the side of the building. All the lights were off as expected. They crouched down, listening for any sounds. A light wind whistled across the yard, blowing a scrap of paper about. Overhead, behind a covering of clouds, a silver sliver of the moon shone dimly. All was still and quiet. Cossack made the hand signal that told Chular to get the door. Moments later, keeping low, they were slipping inside to either side of the door, waiting for their eyes to adapt to the deeper darkness inside. Once he could see again, Cossack signalled to Mayuku to plant the charges on the door frame, while he ventured further into the room. A dim shaft of light from a street lamp picked out the easy chairs and sofas that lined the room. In the centre were groups of the same chairs back to back, forming seating islands, each with a low table in front of them. Freezing suddenly, Cusack held up his hand in the universal halt signal. He'd seen a shape, a lump, on one of the chairs that was out of character with the others. Dropping lower to conceal his body profile more, he froze, waiting for a full two minutes. What was it? A cushion on the chair? A pet animal? Though rare, he had seen some canine-like pets about the court. Or was it a person curled up in the chair? Silently, Cusack leapt forward, twisting his knife in its scabbard, then pulling it free. Inwardly, he cursed his Voltaigan shape. Had he been in his natural shrollen form, he'd have been able to smell the subtleties of its scent and tell what it was. He was level with the first of the central chairs now. Another step and the form grunted and moved. He froze, breathing quietly, trying to get a handle on the scent, any scent. It moved again, lifting an elongated head, sniffing the air loudly. Animal. Cossack flung himself on it and found himself fighting for his life as the snarling beast tried to fasten its jaws around any part of him it could reach. He hissed in pain as the teeth grated across his right forearm. Mayuku joined him, using the butt of his gun to repeatedly beat the creature on the head while it alternately snapped at Cossack's and Mayuku's arms. The snarls and occasional yelps of pain it was producing sounded like clarion calls, loud enough to wake the dead to them. Finally, Cossack got a grip on its head and thrust the knife deep under the jaw. The creature stiffened briefly, then with a final death thrash fell limp to the seat of the chair. Hot blood gushed down the blade and over Cossack's hand as he pulled his knife out, wiping it on the soft, scaled skin of the beast. Get moving, he hissed, nursing his left arm. Mayuku, you paint the sword. The damned animal bit me several times. 
Upstairs, they could hear the floor creaking as someone got out of bed and began to walk across the room above. Sheila ran to the plant the rear door charge as Mayuka pulled the can of spray paint out of the pocket of Cosette's backpack, then headed over to the nearest wall. Climbing up on one of the chairs, he began drawing the zaddy sword on the wall between a tall mirror and an aeronautic painting. Malash cast a handful of zaddy posters into the air, letting them flutter down to the ground. While they did that, Cusack headed back toward the front door, digging in his pack for a scarf and began wrapping it crudely round his left forearm. The last thing he needed to do was leave a blood trail behind him for the authorities to follow. Moments later, the others met him back at the front door, and as silently as they had entered, they left. A quick sprint across the yard and they were out through the gap in the chain-link fence. From there, they hurriedly retraced their steps until they were almost out of line of sight. That was when King... Cusack triggered the detonator. The double explosion lit up the darkened enclosure with a satisfying low crump of sound and display of bright orange flames. Loud shouts and the ringing of fire alarms could be heard in the distance. Let's get out of here, said Cusack quietly, as he headed round the corner. Again keeping to the darkest shadows, finally reached where they parked their vehicle, among several others just like it at the side of a residential area. Once in the car, while the rest stripped off the brake coveralls, and pulled on their normal uniforms. Cusack scrambled out of his coveralls and began wiping the blood off his forearms with it. The bite marks were still weeping blood, and he dabbed futilely at them with the scarf before tying it on again. The distant sounds of sirens were coming closer now, and he could feel the night around them coming alive as people slowly responded to the noise and explosion of fire. Ready? Chilar asked, and getting a chorus of eyes, he started up the engine and drew out of their parking place. Let me see your arm, Captain, said Mayuka from beside him. Malash, get the first aid kit out. Using his knife, he swiftly sliced through the scarf, exposing the oozing bloody gashes that crisscrossed Cusack's forearm. With fire engines and military police all converging on the bottle, a vehicle going in the opposite direction was going to be noticed. Slowly, with the headlights off, Chilar inched the car down the road, stopping abruptly as a vehicle whizzed past it ahead of them at the crossroads. Hold his coveralls under his arm while I pour this antiseptic over it, ordered Mayuku. Shit, that's worse than the damn bite, exclaimed Cusack, with a loud hiss of pain, trying to pull his arm back. we got to get it clean right away, or it could go septic. That was a canine equivalent of a norta, all teeth and attitude, a guard animal. Don't expect them to have one of those. The vehicle edged forward again, and at last they were in the cross street they needed. Sheila waited a moment with the window open, listening for sounds of any other vehicles. Then he turned into the crossing and headed down the road and out of the city. I really hate these missions, said Mayuku with feeling as he bound Cusack's arm up firmly with the bandage in the kit. They twist my guts into huge knots until we're safe home. I think it gets us all the same, said Cusack, flexing his arm and nodding his thanks before getting himself back into his uniform. We've got some breathing space now for a few weeks at least. It'll be down to the other units to do the next few bits. Is this actually having a real effect on the people, asked Chila. We're so close to it that it's difficult to tell. Oh yes, said Malash. The officer class is twitchy about the palace. And you know they are. And you can believe the worker class is even worse. You've been hitting their chapels, their brewery, and now their brothel. They are going to be so mad with their superiors for not protecting their interests that you're going to see challenges happening very soon. How will they happen, asked Mayuku. They just march up to their superior and challenge them to a duel, said Malash. Don't they do it that way for you officers? Not exactly, said Cusack. The physical challenge no longer happens. It's more a calling of the person to account in front of other officers or their superiors. Then they investigate the officer and you'd be replacing with the best person for the job. Huh. I think our way is better. You get a new person immediately if you win. Both ways are pretty brutal. Brutal, said Sheilar, flicking on the headlights as they cleared the last of the city streets and entered the countryside. I seriously suggest you have a bad hunting accident on the estate tomorrow. To explain your injury before we go back to the palace, said Mayuku, helping him ease into his jacket and button it up. Good thought, said Cusack, flexing his arm and clenching his fingers one more time and wincing at the pain. Feels better. Nice job with the field dressing, Mayuku. Thanks. We're going to enough to burn that cover all though. We stop about a mile from the estate and pull into the side there. I can run into the woods and deal with it, said Mayuku. Mazul Palace, Council Meeting, next day. 
This amount of civil unrest should be impossible, Majesty, said General Mazzola. I have units going from door to door in the city, looking for anyone even that even resembles an insurgent. Any people not at work who should be are being rounded up. The ringleader is taken into custody and the rest is escorted back to work. Don't take them all into custody. Shoot half and leave their bodies prominently exposed as a warning to the others, snapped Keduk. They are breaking the laws. They are acting in a way that should be impossible. Workers cannot rebel. Tell them that, countered Inquisitor Ziosh. Killing our workforce isn't the answer, nor is causing more damage amongst them. You should have anticipated this. The trend in the raids was there for all to see. If it was so obvious, Ziosh, why did you fail to spot it? Where is your army of spies when we actually need them? Or you, generals, demanded Keduk, turning and thumping his fists on the table. Last I looked, we were all on the same side, not trying to outdo each other. If we don't work together, we won't find this damned zaddy. What if there isn't one zaddy, said Cusack? What if there's several people? Don't be ridiculous, that General Mazol. Of course it's only one person. How could it be more than one? These workers are workers for a reason. They aren't the brightest ones in the unit. They don't have to be, but the ones that are leading the raids, planting the zaddy information, do. I say they aren't worker castes, said Cusack. I say they are a higher caste. Look at the raids, carried out with precision. They have to be the work of the military. He's right, said Keduk. The raids can be done by a team of soldiers, but their leader or leaders have to be a higher level. They have to be officer caste. I don't know why we didn't see it before. Well, that throws your spy theory out the window, snapped General Gedash. Not entirely, said Cusack. There could still be one person in overall charge. Now that person could still be the spy. Why does it take my newest general to point out clues you should all have noticed? Damn it, you're tacticians, so you keep telling me. Yet you can't analyse us, fake Zaddy's tactics, hissed Keduk. This isn't our lack, Majesty. You're the one who began Lezu. And what have I had you doing for weeks, interrupted Kedi. Keduk. Looking for the spy, looking for those responsible for these raids. You're the military advisor, so advise me, and let's see if we can come up with a plan to stop him. Because so far you've had no suggestions, no insights, nothing. Get out of here, all of you, and come up with some new ideas for the meeting the day after tomorrow, or by all that's holy, I will start looking for younger males who can give me solutions. Keduk waited for the room to empty before venting his wrath. They blame me, me, Zerdish. How dare they? They are advisers and not a scrap of useful advice. Have I had in weeks from them, except for, there is no spy, you waste our resources looking for shadows, and Zaddy is a folk legend, not real, and still the raids continue. There's some merit in the possibility that more than one person is carrying out these raids, said Zardish. It would explain why it's proving difficult to find a pattern for them, and a base of operations. If they triangulate the raid sites, we get nothing. As soon as you have more people involved, the chances of someone letting slip they are a member of the units causing the raids goes up. Nayash is right. It has to be one or more of the officer cast in charge. The rate at which the generals are digging in their heels and not cooperating with me or each other, I'm sure at least one of them is involved. It's possible, Majesty. Possible be damned. Probable more likely. I cannot rule effectively when I have to deal with a group of cast-off ancient generals inherited from my spineless brother. I need people of my own choosing, of a like mind to me. People of action, not ancients stuck in their ways. It's time I harvested them to make way for new blood, Zerdish. Time I got people like Nayash onto this, finding out who's not only loyal to me, but useful as well. Shall I send for Nayash? No, not yet. They will have gone to rumble and hiss their venom at each other. Nayash knows to listen well to what he can. Let him gather some information. We'll talk to him this afternoon, Zerdish, said Keduk, his good humour restored as he got to his feet. 